incident in Gambia, several uh, disasters occurred in the past years, but no record has been done. So World Bank decided to help uh, Gambia and sent several consultants. Some will stay for seven months. So I will stay here for six months to train people on uh, GIS, so Geographic Information System. The training will equip personnel and enable them forecast disasters, which is eventually expected to enable the actors to develop resilient strategies. Since the Gambia is part of countries prone to disasters, this training will greatly mitigate disaster-related effects that hamper progress. First, when there is a, a risk, when there is a disaster, you must warn people. So you must know when, when the risk will occur. So, for instance, if you have heavy flood, heavy rains, you, may, you can see by satellite where heavy rains are, if heavy rains are coming. So you can warn people, say, take care, there could be a, a flood in this area. So. That means the, you must know where the rain is coming, what are the districts or the settlements affected. So to, know, to do that, you must know where the districts are, what are the limits, what are the settlements, where they are, who is the manager of the settlement, who to warn, and so on. Focus is also on strengthening the capacity of NDMA personnel to adequately arm themselves with the requisite skills and knowledge to handle disasters no matter where and when they strike. Modu Bajan, GRTS. We'll be back with news from outside the Gambia after this break. Welcome back. For the first time in nearly two decades, the U.S. government has partially shut down. The last 21 days, the Republican-led House and the Democratic-controlled Senate have failed to reach a spending deal. Senators are expected to vote on another House plan when they meet again. As both sides blame each other for the stalemate, the American people will suffer. Some 800,000 federal employees are being told to stay home. CNN's Christine Rollins has more. Hundreds of thousands of federal civil service employees are waking up to their new furlough status. Our economy is going to be affected by it, and that is scary. It's too much for normal middle class, lower class people to deal with right now. All across the country, national monuments, zoos, and parks closed for business. Along with the government shutdown comes the closure of all the nation's national parks, and that includes Lady Liberty. So for folks coming to New York to see the iconic Statue of Liberty, this may be their last chance, and who knows how long. Welcome aboard Statue Cruises Lady Liberty. Tourists like the Dubois are dealing with not only writing off a paycheck, he works for the government, but writing off their vacation plans as well. There's not much I can do about it. So I'll just, uh, if, if I'm furloughed, what furlough, and we'll just deal with that. The shutdown is sure to take a toll on the employees at these iconic sites as well, like those who work at Liberty Island. It has a big impact on their check. It's about my only source of income. And not only are employees at National Monument staying at home today. And we have liftoff. 97% of NASA employees are closing the office doors on the agency's 55th birthday. Down to D.C., the Washington Monument, Smithsonian, and even the National Zoo closed for business. The National Zoo is a ghost town. It's been closed since 8 p.m. last night. Now, the National Park Service says that anything that's a safety function will continue to be funded. And any employee that comes here to feed and take care of the animals will continue to do that. But if you want to see the pandas online, too bad, even the animal cams are going dark. When they're shut down, it really takes away from things that families can do. Locally owned businesses around the hill worry that lack of tourists will dry up their income as well. D.C. might be the next Detroit because, because, because when half the city's unemployed or, or doesn't have a paying job, this could become Detroit in close to two months. And across to the mountains, national parks taking a hit too. In the Angeles National Forest, this morning, the crown jewels of the park system, Grand Canyon, Yellowstone, Mount Rushmore, Yosemite, all closed. Anyone now in any national park allowing camping has 48 hours to vacate. We've been coming to this park for 35 years. And this is not fun if we have to get booted out. It's very frustrating. I mean, you know, we invested quite a bit to come out here to, you know, to see this. And, uh, you know, it's going to be a huge disappointment. Huge disappointment. 
NATO is carrying out military exercises in the Mediterranean Sea, but they are designed to show more than military might. They also hope to prove the alliance as well as big Navy fleets are still relevant. CNN's Ivan Watson looks at some of the state of the art technology on the aircraft carrier Cavo. An armada of ships at sea. A show of force by the NATO military alliance in the Mediterranean. 23 ships and thousands of sailors and airmen from a dozen countries performing joint exercises to prove that this 64-year-old military alliance can still defend itself in the modern world. This joint force has to be ready if the nations of the world and NATO calls on it. NATO forces have been fighting in Afghanistan for more than a decade, and the alliance helped defeat Muammar Gaddafi's troops in Libya just two years ago. But NATO is not being sent to intervene in the biggest crisis in the region, the civil war in Syria. The situation in Syria has not generated the same kind of consensus that we saw two years ago in Libya in favor of uh, international military intervention, and the military options are not as... Uh, as uh, clear-cut in Syria. Spanish special forces simulate boarding a hostile ship that could be smuggling weapons of mass destruction. But these drills are not just demonstrations of combat readiness. Part of the goal of these exercises is to convince cash-strapped European governments to continue paying for hugely expensive defense programs like aircraft carriers and navies in general. To some critics, big navies are relics of a bygone Cold War era, and tough economic times in Europe have not helped. What we're hoping to see as the financial crisis begins to, uh, to improve is to see uh, the members of NATO collaborate more in developing military capability to get more bang for the euro or more bang for the buck. Sierra <laughs> Goma. On board the Italian aircraft carrier Cavour, it can sometimes feel like the set of some science fiction movie. Italian admirals boast about the cutting-edge technology here, while also stressing flexibility. They say this carrier was converted into a floating hospital that helped treat victims of the earthquake in Haiti in 2010. A combat ship that can also play a unique humanitarian role. That's basically what NATO is calling the aircraft carrier of the 21st century. Ivan Watson, CNN, aboard the Italian aircraft carrier Cavour on the Mediterranean Sea. Monday's news of the death of 36 refugees who drowned off the coast of West Java in Indonesia has sparked a row between Jakarta and Canberra. It is believed they were trying to make their way to Australia by boat. In Jakarta, key talks have been held on asylum seekers, and as Anna Corrin reports, the issue has generated a lot of tension between Australia and Indonesia. And one that's been overshadowed by the contentious asylum seeker issue. At the heart of the problem, Australia's stop the boats policy. He wants the Australian Navy to tow vessels carrying asylum seekers back into Indonesian waters. Abbott's also proposed buying up fishing boats and paying locals for information on people smugglers. A move Jakarta has said is a violation of its sovereignty. We had a very frank discussion about issues of sovereignty and about issues of people smuggling. Each month, hundreds of asylum seekers from countries like Afghanistan, Iran and Iraq board rickety boats along the Indonesian coast to make the dangerous journey to Australia for a better life. Many don't make it. The recent drowning of dozens of asylum seekers, many of them children, a tragic reminder of the risks involved. But 27-year-old Muntaz is not deterred. Fleeing persecution in Pakistan, she arrived in Indonesia two months ago with her three children and elderly father. Here, I am not safe either, she tells me. We have nothing to eat, nowhere to go, no place to stay. We have no other choice. And there is little sympathy from Indonesia, a country that refuses to sign the refugee convention, giving legal rights to asylum seekers. They gave us a burden 
socially and economically.